<laughs> hi, hi, Jennifer, Jennifer and Karen. Okay. Next up, we have a panel entitled, What are General Counsel's Major Policy Priorities? With an outstanding group of general counsels from Cox Enterprises, Facebook, and the Motion Picture Association. Jennifer Hightower is Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary of Cox Enterprises, where she oversees Cox's compliance, legal operations, litigation, regulatory, privacy, employment, and corporate governance matters. Cox Enterprises is a privately held global conglomerate headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, with nearly 50,000 employees and $20 billion in annual revenue. Major divisions include Cox Communications and Cox Automotive. Cox Co Communications is the largest private broadband company in America, serving more than 6.5 million residences and businesses across 18 states. Next, we have Jennifer Newstead, Vice President and General Counsel of Facebook. Prior to joining Facebook in 2019, Ms. Newstead served as the legal advisor of the United States Department of State, and prior to that, practiced law as a partner of the law firm Davis Polk and Wardwell from 2006 to 2018. Earlier in her career, Ms. Newstead has served in other senior roles in government, including General Counsel of the White House OMB, Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General at DOJ, Associate White House Counsel, and she clerked for Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer and Judge Lawrence Silberman of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Karen Temple is Senior Executive Vice President and Global General Counsel for the Motion Picture Association. One of the world's leading authorities on copyright, Ms. Temple oversees all of MPA's content protection efforts around the world. Prior to joining MPA, Ms. Temple served as the Register of Copyrights of the U.S. Copyright Office, where she led the 400-person agency and its eight divisions. Ms. Temple has served on U.S. delegations for the most recently adopted WIPO treaties, including the Beijing Treaty and the Marrakesh Treaty. Ms. Temple also served as Senior Counsel to the Deputy Attorney General of the United States at DOJ, has been Vice President of Litigation and Legal Affairs for the Recording Industry Association of America, as well as the Litigation Associate of the prominent DC-based law firm Williams & Connolly. She also clerked for Judge Nathaniel Jones of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. So thank you all for joining us this morning, especially taking time out from your duties as chief legal officers of large companies. Each of the businesses on this panel make up different parts of the global internet, from content creators, internet service providers, and a global social platform. It would seem that each firm has an interest in a well-functioning ecosystem um, to drive economic growth and connectivity. What are the top challenges or points of tension in policy making, either domestically or globally, that you see for your businesses? Well, I guess I'll, 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 I'll start. Thanks, uh, Sarah. It's a great question. Um, I think it's based on a really important insight that we are all in this together in terms of our, you know, online ecosystem, um, that we have, you know, shared interest. I will say, you know, the old arguments that we used to have of content versus tech you know, we realized are, are, are really outdated. Obviously, you know, on the content side, you know, we really work closely with technology and tech companies to be able to deliver and deploy all of the content that we have um, in a way that our uh, consumers can access it when and where they want. Uh, so I think that, you know, really focusing on how we can work together um, as, um, you know, a uh, many different actors within the online spaces is really important. I will say in terms of um, just the challenges, content protection obviously remains to be, you know, remains a challenge. Um, you know, online piracy is something that, you know, we are always trying to get out ahead of. Obviously, as technology continues to grow and change and innovate, uh, the tools that others are using to, um, you know, do piracy on the internet also grow. Um, so that is a challenge that we continually have to address. I think that you know, one of the issues that we have, you know, points of contention, so to speak, is that, you know, sometimes there are online actors who have different views 
as to what their responsibility and roles should be on um, you know, the internet and in the online ecosystem. Um, we view, again, this as something where it's important for all participants, whether you're an ISP, whether you're a social media platform, or whether you're a content, to work together. Um, we found it to be very, very helpful um, to, to really focus on voluntary, voluntary efforts. Um, we have a number of programs and initiatives that we've worked with you know, various platforms on um, and, and other uh, members of the online ecosystem to really try to make the, the online ecosystem something that um, you know, is, is protective of our consumers as well as something that all um, of those who participate can actually effectively participate and grow in terms of their businesses and services. So I think from our perspective, you know, it's a point of challenge and, and, a, and potentially a point of contention but there are solutions and one of those, I think major solutions is really working together uh, to try to figure out ways that you can make sure that the online ecosystem con continues to thrive and grow for every participant in, in the ecosystem. Well, I'm happy to jump in next. Um, uh, hi, Susan and, and Karen and Jen, it's great to be out here with all of you and with the audience, uh, even if just virtually. Um, and I, I really agree with what Karen said. There's so much that all of us are uh, addressing in the policy realm that really has impacts across the ecosystem. And it's terrific to be having a conversation like this about what is cross-cutting. Um, you know, from Facebook's perspective, uh, you know, we really, um, there are a whole range of things, if you, you know, on your question about what are the most important areas of policymaking that affect our business. We're actually, we take the view that we're really at an inflection point globally in terms of how policymakers and governments around the world are thinking about uh, regulating the internet. I mean, it's as broad as that. Um, the tech sector in particular, large tech platforms, of course, but it's really um, a whole host of questions about how we want to regulate online activity that are you know, getting a tremendous amount of attention. And for us, that translates into a whole range of different areas. Um, where we're eagerly to engaging uh, with policymakers, everything from privacy and safety online to content regulation, uh, questions that are being asked about the size and competitiveness of tech platforms themselves, and of course, how data is used and shared at scale. And, and Facebook is um, views this as a positive thing. We think that regulation is, is uh, overdue in many ways and justified, and we really are um, advocating in a number of areas um, that there be, um, a, you know, a very careful and, and focused look at, at what changes might be necessary. I thought I would just talk about one issue briefly that I think all of us, it may bear on all of us to some extent and maybe on others that are listening, uh, which is this question about um, ensuring that we maintain uh, access to cross-border data flows. Um, and and it, came, it comes up especially in the context of some questions being asked in the last year, especially between about data flows between Europe and the United States. Um, I mean, we all, I think, would agree that the, the free flow of data is critical to maintaining um, not only our services and, and those of many other companies, but the open internet itself depends on it, businesses depend on it. And we have a real question right now uh, based on an interesting legal, a set of legal issues that the European courts have been addressing about whether we're going to have a new framework uh, to govern cross-border data transfer between Europe and the U.S. And as many of your audience will know, the U.S.-EU Privacy Shield, which was the most recent trans sort of government-to-government -government framework, uh, was, was invalidated by the European Court of Justice. There's another uh, residual mechanism that we, is used that relies on cl contractual clauses that was also cast into some doubt. So this is an example where I think it, it would be really important for government actors, government to government uh, negotiators to find a solution to this issue so that we can ensure that we don't um, have any interruption in those critical data flows and, and, uh, and, and in the tremendous amount of, of global trade that depends on them and especially trade back and forth between the US and EU. So that's just an example. Um, there's many, many issues that we're interested in, as I said, from a policymaker perspective. Um, uh, data flows, I think, is a good one to talk about briefly because it just impacts everyone. And it's something that's a live question right now that we understand is being uh, discussed at the highest levels uh, in the transatlantic uh, relationship. So uh, anyway, but I'm glad to talk about any other issues as we get into this, including questions that your, that your audience may have. And I also want to thank you all for including me today. And um, it's nice to see Karen and Jennifer again and Sarah. We, we did a little practice round last week and we all thought we'd be together. And here we are all three virtual, which makes me sad, but um, it's nice to see all of you. I also um, want to admit, I'm still learning to unmute myself a year and a half into this. So apologies for like stumbling that way. Um, 
I, I agree with every policy issue that has just been referenced. It's interesting um, as an ISP provider. So I, I represent Cox Communications. My job no longer is GC of that company, but I, Cox Communications is um, the largest private broadband provider, as was stated, but we are the third largest MSO. So that means in the world of the ecosystem, we're really sort of a, we used to be a big player. Now we're really like a large medium sized player because the ecosystem has grown so much. There are so many bigger and bigger companies, but the policy issues are all still very relevant. Um, they're all the same for all the companies, but I give you that perspective because you have a very large company on the panel today, and then you have a very large policy player on the player in the panel today. And as Cox, we are in this ecosystem, we're sort of the middle-sized player. And all the issues that were referenced today have the same impact on us. And I say that from my perspective as a general counsel of a business um, that is obviously a privately held company as referenced, we're always very focused on the business implications for any of the policies. So for us, not only everything that was referenced in the sense of privacy is relevant, um, piracy is very relevant for us because that is something that was still needing to be worked through legally. What are all the legal capabilities for both the ISPs and for the internet ecosystem holistically? I agree completely with Karen. I think ideally there should be more industry consensus in this space to help us get somewhere because it doesn't need to be resolved in the courts. The other issues that my company really has to face is we really work a lot on broadband investment. That is a very big issue for us. Where are we going to invest our dollars? What is the regulation in relation to that? Um, there's always, there's lots of context in this space. There's, there's an executive order now being um, implemented through rulemaking and that is, there's a lot of open questions there about, does the funding go to underserved? Does it go to unserved? What is the funding? Does it go to middle mile? Does it go to do also how much funding should be served for unserved um, customers? What, what is those definitions? And then you can also get into the requirement of making sure that the internet's there for in an affordable service um, for all the customers who need it. Because that's one thing we learned during COVID is internet is something that is very necessary. But the irony at the same time, it's a, it's a business that was, in, was primarily developed by private investment dollars. So there is definitely a natural tension there. Um, and the regulation is simply not clear. Um, one thing I can say from our company's perspective is we would love to have a little bit more clarity in the law in relation to how the internet is regulated. I think it's something that needs to be resolved through Congress versus through the administrative bodies because we've been back and forth over a lot of these regulations so many years. Matter of fact, almost my whole career has in some ways addressed some of these issues. So that'll be something else I think would be interesting to see if there's more conversation about that. And then the other policy issues that are really relevant, this isn't going to surprise anyone, is privacy holistically, cybersecurity holistically. These are just issues that um, impact how we, how we provide the service that is so essential to the country. So long way of saying there really isn't an issue that doesn't impact an internet service provider. It is an evolving ecosystem, even though it is something that I think everybody in this room uses extensively. Believe it or not, it's something we still have to continue to make sure the entire country has access to, which is something that Cox is very committed to. So thank you again for including me today. Great. Um, well, each of your businesses has different policy priorities. One common theme might be your posture towards the business climate and regulatory trends here and abroad, like you stated. Um, one common policy area might be data privacy practices and legislation. So um, you mentioned privacy. What are your views on regulation in this area? What kind of clarity is necessary? Um, do you think it's possible to see privacy legislation soon? I'm happy to go first because I think Jennifer's going to really have a much more detailed answer, and it's going to be one that I can't wait to hear. So I'm going to go high level because I think we may all have some uniformity on that. Um, when we spoke before, I said this, and everybody's like, yeah, that makes sense. And I think it's not something that's going to be rocket science to the room. What I think from our, my company's perspective is we need clarity. And honestly, we, from Cox's perspective, we need clarity from, a, as I stated before, legislation. Privacy is something that we want a national privacy resolution. I don't, right now, we are reacting to state regulations, um, which can differ. And it's very hard to build an effective privacy database and a privacy program that is in compliance with one state's law when you're a nationwide service provider. I'm, Cox is not international, so then you have the complexities if you're international, they'll flow it, throw those layers on top of that. We also have the challenge, um, I'm sure the other service, the other panelists have too, that we're regulated by so many different entities. 
Um, Cox is regulated by the FCC, the FTC. We have treasury overhang. We have obviously federal laws, various federal laws, depending on the service you're actually talking about that we're providing because we provide video, telephone, soon to be wireless services, internet services, home security services. That all has different regulatory implications with different requirements. And then to have privacy as something that is considered unique by one state and different by another state, it's very difficult. So what happens is you pretty much wind up playing to the most restrictive um, regulator, but that is, but that means one state is literally um, dictating how you mandate the controls of your privacy program. So from Cox's perspective, we feel strongly that it'd be ideal to get a na national uniform privacy law. And I'll just jump in as well, because I think that Jennifer, as I said, will probably bring it bring us all home on the privacy point. Um, I, I think, you know, we view, you know, the, the, these as important conversations, both domestically and, 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 and abroad in terms of, you know, how we should approach privacy. I would say from kind of the content creator side, one of the things that we would caution is that as we have those conversations, we just want to make sure that they are deliberate conversations. They really really consider um, how regulation and privacy rules will affect our ability to um, go after bad actors in the online environment. I know that, you know, you know, for example, in, in the in the EU, uh, the interpretation that ICANN has had with respect to the GDPR has really affected our ability to um, get who is data, to be able to go after certain, um, you know, bad actors in the online space. So I think it's an important conversation to have, and, and there are a lot of different different, I, I think, perspectives, but we just want to make sure that as we have those conversations that we balance, um, you know, the need, obviously, for consumer privacy, but also the need for us to be able to make sure, you know, kind of as I discussed earlier, that the online ecosystem, you know, continues to be able to, to thrive for everyone. Great. And I'm happy to, to round us out. Um, and I really agree with what Jen and Karen have said, and, and there's a lot of overlap between their, their focus on the need for more uniform, consistent standards in the United States, for example, and how that would help us. But, but just taking a step back, I just say from a personal perspective, I came to Facebook at a time when we um, had had just entered, we're just entering into a comprehensive agreement with the FTC, one of our lead regulators on this issue, um, that required really a rebuilding and reconstituting of our privacy compliance and data control posture from the ground up. And so I've really made, this has been an issue that's been absolutely front and center for me, certainly throughout my time at Facebook, and, and it will be for the foreseeable future. Um, and we are uh, fully committed to um, the, the not only the need to comply with the existing regulation, but as, as you both have said, the, the focus on what we can do to support the development of more consistent global standards. You know, this is, as we as we all know, we have you know very uh, strong um, privacy laws in some jurisdictions, and many other countries are, uh, the EU uh, leading the way with GDPR, and others um, racing to catch up. We have uh, more of a patchwork in the U.S. of federal and state laws. Um, and Sarah, you asked about you know will we see legislation? We certainly support. Um, and have long supported uh, comprehensive federal privacy legislation in the United States, um, and and for the same reasons that that both Jen and Karen have said, you know, it would be um, given the focus that we all have in industry on trying to build um, the right systems for compliance and the right the right policies to ensure that our services operate um, appropriately on these issues and really offer strong protections to our users. Um, the more we can have clarity and consistency in what those standards are, the, the, the more uh, um, capable we are of administering that well. Um, and, you know, we we obviously, there's many areas that, that we've all seen privacy regulation evolve that are critical, um, the, the kinds of protections that we are especially focused on, uh, which many of the existing laws also focus on now are, you know, giving users the rights and to control their own data, like the ability to access it and delete it and move it um, uh, portably from service to service. Um, of course, requiring that companies handle data responsibly, having strong internal processes to protect information. Um, enforcement authority for regulators is important as well. Um, and so, um, you know, all of those are the, the typical and, and important areas that, that are discussed by policymakers. I think the one other thing that I would say, and I'm uh, curious if my fellow panelists would agree, is, you know, we do need to balance those important interests with with continuing to foster innovation and maintain the ability to company to develop and offer new services to users while doing so in a privacy protective way. Um, that's something that I know the regulators and policymakers think about as well. 
Um, and it's why I think this, if this can be a subject of more dialogue back and forth between industry and, and government, that's always, that's always a positive thing. So I personally, I, I, I don't, I don't know if we'll see legislation, but I certainly think um, there's been a lot of obvious interest in it um, congressionally in the United States, uh, around the world. Um, we do operate internationally and we're seeing a proliferation of new privacy regulation globally. So I'm hopeful that that may uh, ultimately converge towards more consistent standards and, and more clear uh, roadmap for compliance. Well, indeed, um, digitization continues to change the way consumers spend their time online, the way motion pictures are streamed and released, um, how much bandwidth we need to do all these things at home and at work. Um, so in, in thinking about the future, like what should policymakers know about how your businesses take risks, but also think about compliance and, and regulation? Um, how do you how do you balance both from the general counsel's office? You, you're probably your number one goal is risk management, but then the business side, you know, they have to take um, risks and and go for for change. How do you how do you think about um, the future? Well, I, you know, I can jump here in here just in terms of from the, the creative side and, and, and certainly the film industry. Obviously, you know, the, the film industry is based on on risk and risk taking. Uh, as most people know, you know, most films don't actually make money. Um, and, you know, it, it, you know, it's you need to have, you know, 10 or 20 films um, before, you know, that are going to flop before you get that, you know, that that hit or that blockbuster. So, you know, the, the film industry is an industry that, you know, constantly takes risk. Risk. I think um, the important thing to, to be able to ensure, however, is that as we take risk, as the industry takes risk in this way, um, certainly devotes a lot of resources and, you know, you know, economic, you know, resources, most likely, and as well as human resources into these types of projects, that you have that framework that will allow that risk to be a manageable risk. And so that is ensuring that, you know, you have, you know, whether you're talking about regulations or laws, that you have, you know, a framework again, Again, you know, kind of that goes back to that online ecosystem that allows us to thrive. You don't want to take all the risks and then have no backstop because the regulatory regime or the, the legal regime doesn't respect piracy. I mean, <laughs> sorry, wrong word, doesn't respect copyright um, and allows piracy rather to, to, to flourish. So I think it's, you know, that balance, ensuring that um, you have the ability to be able to take as much risk with your business as possible, knowing that you have that backstop of government regulation or we're really more government law, the consistency of, of the law and the framework to really be able to make those risks worthwhile. I think, you know, in addition to having the backing of, you know, the, the, the governments in terms of ensuring that you have a consistent rule of law, you know, as I mentioned, having the ability um, as industries to be able to talk to one another and, and to have those voluntary um, agreements or, you know, um, ways, you know, if government hasn't stepped in in a certain area that allow you to mitigate whatever risks you have in the online ecosystem, I think that's also important. So I, I think more in, increasingly as general counsels, you're also having those types of conversations conversations. Um, you're working on improving the legal framework and improving the policy framework for your businesses, but you're also reaching across, you know, I won't say the aisle, but reaching across with your, your counterparts and in the online ecosystem to try to work together to figure out, you know, solutions that will allow you both to, to, to thrive. We've worked, you know, very, very closely in the last um, couple of years with both Facebook and Google on a number of um, voluntary initiatives and working to, to really figure out how we can improve the online ecosystem. And I think having those direct relationships has really proven to be, um, you know, an important aspect as, uh, of uh, us being able to take additional risks in, term, in terms of our creative content and putting things out there. Yes, I agree. And, and I'll, just, I'll just follow up by saying, uh, you know, it's a great question, actually, because just as you say, um, we are, as chief legal officers, we're all focused on risk management and on ensuring that as our companies continue to grow and expand their business and the technology continues to evolve, it, all of that is happening in a way where we can ensure um, that legal and compliance um, issues are gonna be front and center. And I'll just, from my perspective, one of the things that um, I think policymakers and industry should work together on is trying to look forward, see what the future vision is for the way that our, that our businesses and platforms and companies may, may evolve and technology itself may evolve and how we can 
identify the principles and standards at the outset that are going to be relevant, even as even as technology shifts in ways that we can't or we can't always foresee what's going to be at the end of that and embed those principles, standards, concepts as early as we can so that things you're not in a position of things developing and then regulation is racing to catch up, but it's rather happening simultaneously. Um, I'll give you an example that's been on my mind um, and it, it picks up on your point about what is the future and how do we think about the future as GCs. You know, um, we've been talking publicly, our leadership has been talking publicly about um, what we refer to as the metaverse. Uh, which is a way of describing uh, what a future stage of what with our successor really to the mobile internet might look like. And it really refers to how we might have connection and interact with each other in the future in a virtual or augmented 3D world rather than the 2D world that we're used to on the internet or on Zoom. And at the core of it is this concept of presence. So can we replicate through new technology the feeling of virtual presence with others and have the kind of connection that you can have more easily when you're physically present in the same space, even if that's happening in a virtual 3D way that you have today only when you're live together. So it's a bold and big concept. Um, it's not something that, that is specific to Facebook. It's actually a concept that many companies are talking about in the tech industry um, and are working on building. And if it does come to exist, um, which I very much hope it does because it's an exciting vision. Um, it'll be something that many companies help to build and have different services and, 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 and products to offer in. But it obviously raises a whole host of questions about regulation and how will we ensure that the standards around all the issues we've talked about on this panel um, are operating effectively in this very new space um, and which will raise new challenges. Uh, so I just cite that as an example. I personally find it a very inspiring and, and exciting vision, but I think what we need to be thinking about constantly in our roles and our colleagues as well, is what are those questions that it will raise? How will policymakers and regulators think about those questions? How can we, um, if possible, uh, understand as early as we can what expectations they will have for how we'll operate in those spaces um, so that we, we can be in a situation where they can evolve as much in parallel as possible? Um, and certainly that's how I'm thinking about it. Um, but I can also just tell you, uh, if this is a, something that you've not yet thought about, um, the metaverse vision of the future, I'll just say, it's very interesting. I'll just give you an example. Imagine that we were holding this panel in a virtual space where we could see each other virtually represented, let's say as a, not today, but maybe in the future as a hologram or an image of each other. And we could have the feeling of presence, even though for whatever set of practical reasons, we can't all be together. Or imagine that that same thing applying to fitness or to you know social experiences like going to a concert or uh, any travel, anything else that that we um, that we can imagine that we enjoy doing uh, together in the real world. So uh, just as an example, I think the main point is I think it is critical that we all be thinking today about those sorts of technology features as they're going to exist and what we need to do to take our commitment to compliance and move it forward into those spaces as they're built. So I'll leave it there. That's a hard one to follow. I'm just going to be transparent. I don't have anything like that, but that is fascinating. Um, Prox is not that innovative. So thank goodness that we learned that. That's, and I will say one of, the, one of the ways, I think Karen said it really well. I think um, the reality is for all of us in our roles, I mean, we're all required to know black letter law and then to also assess risk about the industries we're in. And clearly the, the goal here is to help our industries grow. And we, we're not going to invest our dollars unless we have some sense that where we are recommending is a safe space or is there is, there is a lot of future growth. So the, the answer is things like this forum is a way, great way for more collaboration and more learning. Um, I think the answer also is we're, I think that I think what Jennifer said about putting together principles at the at having alignment on principles at the outset is really helpful because regulation really does always seem to lag behind. So there would be a way for all of us to be able to um, it, it help with future growth. The biggest challenge my company has is honestly making sure that they invest their dollars at the right place. We have limited. It's a it's a private company. It's a very successful private company, but it's a private company. We have limited spaces to allocate the dollars. So we want to make sure we're doing it in a place that will bring the maximum growth for our shareholders. So that's just, that's not anything that's revolutionary, but it's a statement of how so many businesses look at the world. So forums like this, conversations like this help us get to that place of knowing how to help advise our, customers, our clients. Great, thanks. Um, and just before I ask our, our final question, I'd, I wondered if there are Slido questions. I, I don't, I can't see a screen, so not, not for this session right now yet, okay. 
Okay, so um, as general counsels, each of you seem to have dual roles in looking outward externally and also inward. So you're managing all the litigation um, that's coming through your organizations, corporate governance. How do you spend your time as general counsels and how do you see your role as the, to the company, to the CEO, to the board of directors? I'm happy to go first, and I'm sure others will have much more to supplement. Um, for me, my, my, my day is different every day. It really is. Um, you plan the day, and then whatever the crisis of the day is what over supersedes the day. Um, my role is definitely as advisor to the executive, the senior executives, but it's also to ensure that I've got the relationships with the client base. Um, it's also making sure in this role that you really understand the business. Um, it's not a just a pure legal role. You have to understand the business and the policies and priorities or you want to be success. To be a general counsel, you have to understand your, where your, your business objectives are so you know how to help them get there. Um, and then I, this is, I don't think it's surprising, but, but a big part of your role is management, which is not very sexy, but that's, that's the truth. Yeah, hopefully you have really, really, really talented people working on your team, which fortunately I do, and I'm certain my peers do too. Um, but but it's, it's, it's a great job. I highly recommend it to anybody who ever wants one. So happy to talk about that. Yeah, and I would just, I mean, I, I agree exactly what Jen said. I think, you know, it, you know, your day changes. And so the uh, ability to, to be able to um, be flexible uh, in terms of what happens on any given day and, and how you might want to address um, those issues, um, I think is an important you know, ability in terms of a, a general counsel. I'll say, you know, for me, I, you know, I started, um, so I haven't been at the, the Motion Picture Association very long, it'll be two years in January, and I started um, in January of last year, or a year and a half ago, right when the pandemic was uh, beginning to take off, and you know, my I initially thought that you know my focus was going to you know be on you know we, you know a lot of the content protection litigation that we were doing, and I would be flying around the world to our various offices overseas to to um, you know continue to work on a number of the issues, um, and I did that for about three months, and then everything shut down. And so I had gone from a focus, you know, kind of on the standard bread and butter of, you know, supporting our advocacy group and, and also working on our content protection to what do we do in, 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 in a pandemic? How do we make sure that our, our teams around the world are protected? Um, so, you know, you never know, I think, in terms of what might hit you and, you know, with respect to your role as a general counsel and being flexible and, and able to, to, to um, meet whatever challenges I think is, is really important. Being that strategic strategic advisor, not seeing your role just as uh, a straight, uh, you know, I'm going to, you know, just say what the law is, but being part of a senior leadership team, I think is important as well, having great relationships, obviously with the CEO, but the other leaders within the organization, because you want, you know, everyone to feel comfortable coming to you if there's a question or an issue. It's, it's much better if, if someone comes and asks um, about an issue before um, they make a decision on their own, and then you have to go in and and, and try to help clean it up. So I think having building those relationships with your senior leadership team and with you know folks around the, the organization are also a, a really important aspect uh, of, of being a leader and, and, and of being a GC. And, and as I said, kind of in response to an earlier question, also now I think it's increasingly um, doing things, as Jen mentioned, like these conferences, having the opportunity to get to know other GCs um, in the industry or in related industries, because you are going to be working you know, really closely with them you know, as you, you know, address some of these myriad of issues that come about um, as, you know, technology and innovation continues to grow at such a, a fast pace. So um, I think that's also an important aspect, not only that internal role, but that external role in terms of being able to help lead the company as you continue to, um, you know, have conversations with your, your counterparts around the world. Yeah, and, and I, I agree, and, and I would say that there's a lot of commonality, not surprisingly, in how the three of us spend our time every day. Um, maybe what I can add, you know, I, I, I would fully agree, you know, you, as a leader of the company and a leader of the legal compliance teams, you, you're a, you want to be a trusted partner, a trusted advisor to your, to your business leadership and to your board. Um, you obviously are committed, as everyone is, to the company's mission and strategy and, and to accomplishing that. But I, ha I would just add that from my perspective, looking over the almost 30 years now that I've been a lawyer, I think the role has evolved quite a bit and that we may be in what almost feels to me like a second shift. So what I mean is, I feel like if you go back to the beginning of that time, 
GCs were lawyers running an internal team. Often a lot of the most interesting work was done externally. And then there was a, what I think of as the first shift in which a lot of the um, more direct responsibility for overseeing day-to-day -day legal work came in-house and, and general counsels adopted a focus on compliance and integrity and on systems and processes, just, just following along with how regulation was evolving. That became a critical part of the role as well. And the role became correspondingly maybe more significant and took on more, more direct responsibility for how issues are executed within a business. I think of that as almost the paradigm of that as almost being Ben Heinemann's role at GE, if you go back to that era when it was sort of, you know, leading with integrity became part of the mantra that, that every GC really wants to, wants to follow. The shift that I think we may have made now, but I'm curious if you all agree, is we're, we're, we're still doing all of that. And now there's almost a, a different expectation of corporate responsibility that's taken hold. And not only for the legal team to worry about, many many of the, the CEO, of course, and company leadership has to think about it, but a lot of the stakeholders that companies interact with have higher expectations today than ever for how companies will show up on policy questions. What positions are you taking? What is, what is the impact that your products are having on the world? We all face and get those questions. We certainly do at Facebook every day. And I think that may be another shift where it's even broadening the lens so that you're you're thinking not purely about the legal and even the compliance issues, but actually more broadly about these societal issues. It, it certainly makes it a fascinating additional um, set of ri risks, but also just policy questions to manage. I just tell you that at, at Facebook, we, we in some ways, because uh, so, so many questions are rightly asked about uh, our services and how we act responsibly in the world, given our scale. Uh, we've done some things that are fairly novel, but I think may become more interesting to others in the world as, as, as these, if this shift is really happening. Given that my examples are, we created a civil rights function within our legal team in the past two years following a succession of civil rights audits that the company did. So I now have a deputy general counsel who reports to me who leads a company-wide civil rights organization which is just a phenomenal, a phenomenal thing. I, I have to say, I'm, I'm so happy that we've done it. it. It allows us to have embedded in our team and available as a resource to our colleagues, that perspective across our services, across product development, across you know, our public facing um, interaction with stakeholders. So it's, that may not be something that every company needs and for obvious reasons, but it's something that is an innovation that kind of speaks to what I'm saying about corporate responsibility. And the other thing that, that we did that other companies have also done, I know, is, is to adopt a human rights policy that is more expressly committing us to human rights principles in the way that we operate internationally. That's something that's a shared responsibility of several functions, not just legal. All of which is just to say, I, I do think we're in this period where the role itself may be shifting again. I'd be curious if you, if you both agree with that, but it, it makes it more challenging, but more interesting. And it, and it fuses a bit the pure legal and the non-legal aspects of sort of corporate responsibility in a, in a way that I don't think existed 20 years ago. Um, so. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I just to jump in there, I mean, I would agree wholeheartedly, I think, you know, as you know, just the, the issue of social responsibility and, and corporate responsibility is is at the forefront now. I think, you know, you you have you, you increasingly see this pressure for companies to not just worry, obviously, about the bottom line, but to actually take a stance on certain social issues that maybe they wouldn't have even commented on in the past, just, you know, given, you know, the um, various civil rights issues and, and racial injustice and the and, and, equality issues that, you know, we've all been discussing over the last several years. So I think, you know, as a general counsel kind of helping to um, be part of that conversation, be uh, part of that moral backbone of, of the company and, and have those conversations, um, you obviously can bring to it the your, your legal background in terms of the, the importance of, you know, you know, uh, you know, maintaining, um, you know, equality and, and equity within the company, but also kind of your own experiences and, and, um, you know, your values and ensuring that the the company itself kind of uh, you know meets the values that the company has. Uh, I was you know fortunate uh, just recently to to be able to testify before the House Judiciary Committee on diversity and equity and inclusion in Hollywood. Um, and, you know, we, you know, talked about, you know, during that hearing, you know, the fact that there really was a lot of work, obviously it remains to be done in, in Hollywood on these issues. Um, but we also discussed, and I was able to dis discuss some of the increasing things that we've been doing as an industry and, and individual studios have been doing to address some of these diversity and equity um, issues. So I think that that's really critical. And yeah, increasingly, I think you'll see the general counsel be, 
an integral part of those conversations um, from a legal perspective, a moral perspective, and just a personal perspective. Um, and, and I will say, just even looking at our panel today, I'm, I'm, I'm um, really pleased to see that you know we have a, a panel of, of, of very strong women uh, to discuss all these issues. Um, and it just you know goes to, I think, it, it show the, the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how um, you know, critical that is kind of almost in a every aspect of your business. And again, and it's not just something that internally, I think, um, you know, is demanded, which it certainly is. But I think as, as Jennifer mentioned, you know, externally, there's it, it, the consumers and, 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 and people that you are working with are going to increasingly demand and expect that these companies that might not have said anything before um, have policies or make statements or, you know, in some way um, will participate in the conversation that's going on um, in the United States uh, around some of these really important issues. I couldn't agree more. And I actually really appreciate you bringing it up, Jennifer and Karen. You just, you, you took it one step farther. And I would say, Everything you all said, I completely agree with. It is completely a new addition to the role. Um, and I think it's one that's going to continue to evolve. Um, we always had this mantra at Cox of do the right thing. Well, that do the right thing, and that wasn't strong enough in the world that we live in today. And so clearly this conversation has really, really evolved for us. And just to supplement, um, the only other constituency that we're really having to also recognize we need to be more clear and be like a leader for is our employee base. It's, it's required enough from our employees. Um, they're our most value asset. And we're, we, we wanna make sure they understand that we understand how important they are. And the other variable that we're having to really work through this whole diversity inclusion space is also sustainability. That's, a, that's become a, another very, very strong core value that we um, are championing, but we're, it's a constant mindset that we have to make sure we're doing the right thing in that space too. And you're, it, for, for me, it is, definitely, it is definitely on the top three things I have to think about with every issue I have to focus on. I don't have the scope of, I mean, I think that's phenomenal, like having a civil, civil rights uh, subject matter expertise on your team. I would love something like that. I don't have that kind of ability. So it's another thing that's sort of, I hate to say this, on the side of my desk, but it's at the side of the desk that's moved to the front of the desk because it's the right thing to do. And it's, it's also where my company wants to be. But it's a constant navigation because it, it, it's, this, is an, this is an evolving time. I mean, we're, it's, it's, it's the right time. It's a little bit late in some ways for all of us, but it's the right time for all of us to lean in on these issues. So great, it was a great call out. Thank you. On that note, I um, just want to say thank you to our, uh, our panel today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.